Welcome back. I'm Logan, your host for the Daily Bible Reading Podcast, where we are journeying through the Bible chronologically, taking it one day at a time. Today is day number 253, and we are continuing in Ezekiel's vision of the heavenly temple. And here, he watches the glory of God returning to its dwelling place. Now, there's no more worry that he's just going to leave, because on this side of the cross, we know that Jesus came as the temple of God, and he has sent his Holy Spirit to indwell his followers. Now, we have much to be thankful for, so let's give him thanks today. Father, we thank you for the connection that you have enabled us to have with you in Christ. Without your grace, we would be lost in our sin, stuck in the darkness. But you come to us in the midst of our exile, and you shine your light into our hearts. And to everyone who believes, you give the right to become part of your family. You don't do this because there's something missing in you that we fill up, or because we are worthy of your affection, but precisely the opposite. In the midst of our failures and our deficiencies, you work in us to the glory of your great name. As we stand before your holy word, we are exposed and stripped of all the things that we sometimes try to use to cover our sin. As believers, you see us as we truly are, and you don't turn your face from us in disgust. Instead, You hold our gaze, and you remind us that Jesus has washed us clean, and he has covered us with his holiness. Help us to remember this, to walk in this new life that you have given us, to flee from sin and temptation, and to grow in holiness as you transform us through your word. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, we're on our last couple of days of the book of Ezekiel, concluding his final vision of this heavenly temple and the restoration and renewal that God has promised to his children. I'm ready to read if you are. Let's go. Then he led me to the gate, the gate facing east. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was coming from the east. And the sound of his coming was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. And the vision I saw was just like the vision that I had seen when he came to destroy the city, and just like the vision that I had seen by the Chebar Canal. And I fell on my face. As the glory of the Lord entered the temple by the gate facing east, the Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. While the man was standing beside me, I heard one speaking to me out of the temple, and he said to me, Son of man, this is the place of my throne, and the place of the soles of my feet, where I will dwell in the midst of the people of Israel forever. And the house of Israel shall no more defile my holy name, neither they nor their kings, by their whoring and by the dead bodies of their kings at their high places, by setting their threshold by my threshold and their doorposts beside my doorposts, with only a wall between me and them. They have defiled my holy name by their abominations that they have committed, so I have consumed them in my anger. Now let them put away their whoring and the dead bodies of their kings far from me, and I will dwell in their midst forever. As for you, son of man, describe to the house of Israel the temple, that they may be ashamed of their iniquities, and that they shall measure the plan. And if they are ashamed of all that they have done, make known to them the design of the temple, its arrangement, its exits, and its entrances, that is, its whole design. And make known to them as well all its statutes, and its whole design, and all its laws, and write it down in their sight, so that they may observe all its laws, and all its statutes, and carry them out. This is the law of the temple, the whole territory on top of the mountain, all around, shall be most holy. Behold, this is the law of the temple. These are the measurements of the altar by cubits, the cubit being a cubit and a handbreadth. Its base shall be one cubit high and one cubit broad, 
with a rim of one span around its edge, and this shall be the height of the altar. From the base, on the ground, to the lower ledge, two cubits, with a breadth of one cubit, and from the smaller ledge, to the larger ledge, four cubits, with a breadth of one cubit, and the altar hearth, four cubits, and from the altar hearth projecting upwards, four horns. The altar hearth shall be square, twelve cubits long by twelve broad. The ledge also shall be square, fourteen cubits long by fourteen broad, with a rim around it half a cubit broad, and its base one cubit all around. The steps of the altar shall face east. And he said to me, Son of man, thus says the Lord God, These are the ordinances for the altar. On the day when it is erected for offering burnt offerings upon it, and for throwing blood against it, you shall give to the Levitical priests of the family of Zadok, who draw near to me to minister to me, declares the Lord God, a bull from the herd for a sin offering. And you shall take some of its blood and pour it on the four horns of the altar, and on the four corners of the ledge, and upon the rim all around. Thus you shall purify the altar and make atonement for it. You shall also take the bull of the sin offering, and it shall be burned in the appointed place belonging to the temple outside the sacred area. And on the second day you shall offer a male goat without blemish for a sin offering, and the altar shall be purified, as it was purified with the bull. When you have finished purifying it, you shall offer a bull from the herd without blemish, and a ram from the flock without blemish. You shall present them before the Lord, and the priests shall sprinkle salt on them, and offer them up as a burnt offering to the Lord. For seven days you shall provide daily a male goat for a sin offering, also a bull from the herd and a ram from the flock, without blemish shall be provided. Seven days shall they make atonement for the altar and cleanse it, and so consecrate it. And when they have completed these days, then from the eighth day onward, the priests shall offer on the altar your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, and I will accept you, declares the Lord God. Chapter 44 Then he brought me back to the outer gate of the sanctuary, which faces east, and it was shut. And the Lord said to me, This gate shall remain shut, it shall not be opened, and no one shall enter by it. For the Lord, the God of Israel, has entered by it. Therefore it shall remain shut. Only the prince may sit in it to eat bread before the Lord. He shall enter by the way of the vestibule of the gate, and shall go out by the same way. Then he brought me by way of the north gate to the front of the temple, and I looked, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the temple of the Lord, and I fell on my face. And the Lord said to me, Son of man, mark well, see with your eyes and hear with your ears all that I shall tell you concerning all the statutes of the temple of the Lord and all its laws, and mark well the entrance to the temple and all the exits from the sanctuary, and say to the rebellious house, to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, O house of Israel, enough of all your abominations, in admitting foreigners, uncircumcised in heart and flesh, to be in my sanctuary, profaning my temple, when you offer to me my food, the fat and the blood. You have broken my covenant, in addition to all your abominations, and you have not kept charge of my holy things, but you have set others to keep charge for you in my sanctuary. Thus says the Lord God, No foreigner, uncircumcised in heart and flesh, of all the foreigners who are among the people of Israel, shall enter my sanctuary. But the Levites, who went far from me, going astray from me after their idols when Israel went astray, shall bear their punishment. They shall be ministers in my sanctuary, having oversight at the gates of the temple and ministering in the temple. They shall slaughter the burnt offering and the sacrifice for the people, and they shall stand before the people to minister to them. Because they ministered to them before their idols and became a stumbling block of iniquity to the house of Israel. Therefore I have sworn concerning them, declares the Lord God, and they shall bear their punishment. They shall not come near to me to serve me as priest, nor come near any of my holy things and the things that are most holy, but they shall bear their shame and the abominations that they have committed. Yet I will appoint them to keep charge of the temple, to do all its service, and all that is to be done in it. But the Levitical priests, the sons of Zadok, who kept the charge of my sanctuary when the people of Israel went astray from me, shall come near to me to minister to me, 
and they shall stand before me to offer me the fat and the blood, declares the Lord God. They shall enter my sanctuary, and they shall approach my table to minister to me, and they shall keep my charge. When they enter the gates of the inner court, they shall wear linen garments. They shall have nothing of wool on them, while they minister at the gates of the inner court and within. They shall have linen turbans on their heads, and linen undergarments around their waists. They shall not bind themselves with anything that causes sweat. And when they go out into the outer court to the people, they shall put off the garments in which they have been ministering, and lay them in the holy chambers. And they shall put on other garments, lest they transmit holiness to the people with their garments. They shall not shave their heads, nor let their locks grow long. They shall surely trim the hair of their heads. No priest shall drink wine when he enters the inner court. They shall not marry a widow or a divorced woman, but only virgins of the offspring of the house of Israel, or a widow who is the widow of a priest. They shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the common, and show them how to distinguish between the unclean and the clean. In a dispute they shall act as judges, and they shall judge it according to my judgments. They shall keep my laws and my commandments and all my appointed feasts, and they shall keep my Sabbaths holy. They shall not defile themselves by going near to a dead person. However, for father or mother, for son or daughter, for brother or unmarried sister, they may defile themselves. After he has become clean, they shall count seven days for him. And on the day that he goes into the holy place, into the inner court, to minister in the holy place, he shall offer his sin offering, declares the Lord God. This shall be their inheritance. I am their inheritance, and you shall give them no possession in Israel. I am their possession. They shall eat the grain offering, the sin offering, and the guilt offering, and every devoted thing in Israel shall be theirs. And the first of all the first fruits of any kind, and every offering of all kinds from all your offerings, shall belong to the priests. You shall also give to the priests the first of your dough, that a blessing may rest on your house. The priests shall not eat of anything, whether bird or beast, that has died of itself, or is torn by wild animals. Chapter 45 When you allot the land as an inheritance, you shall set apart for the Lord a portion of the land as a holy district, twenty-five thousand cubits long and twenty thousand cubits broad. It shall be holy throughout its whole extent. Of this, a square plot of five hundred by five hundred cubits shall be for the sanctuary, with fifty cubits for an open space around it. And from this measured district you shall measure off a section twenty-five thousand cubits long and ten thousand broad, in which shall be the sanctuary, the most holy place. It shall be the holy portion of the land. It shall be for the priests who minister in the sanctuary and approach the Lord to minister to him. And it shall be a place for their houses and a holy place for the sanctuary. Another section, 25,000 cubits long and 10,000 cubits broad, shall be for the Levites who minister at the temple as their possession for cities to live in. Alongside the portion set apart as the holy district, you shall assign for the property of the city an area 5,000 cubits broad and 25,000 cubits long. It shall belong to the whole house of Israel. And to the prince shall belong the land on both sides of the holy district and the property of the city, alongside the holy district and the property of the city on the west and on the east, corresponding in length to one of the tribal portions, and extending from the western to the eastern boundary of the land. It is to be his property in Israel, and my princes shall no more oppress my people, but they shall let the house of Israel have the land according to their tribes. Thus says the Lord God, Enough, O princes of Israel, put away violence and oppression, and execute justice and righteousness. Cease your evictions of my people, declares the Lord God. The ephah and the both shall be of the same measure, the both containing one-tenth of a homer, and the ephah one-tenth of a homer. The homer shall be the standard measure. The shekel shall be twenty geras. Twenty shekels plus twenty-five shekels plus fifteen shekels shall be your mina. This is the offering that you shall make, one-sixth of an ephah from each homer of wheat, and one-sixth of an ephah from each homer of barley. And as the fixed portion of oil measured in baths, one-tenth of a bath from each core, the core, like the homer, contains ten baths, and one sheep from every flock of two hundred, 
from the watering places of Israel for grain offering, burnt offering, and peace offerings, to make atonement for them, declares the Lord God. All the people of the land shall be obliged to give this offering to the prince in Israel. It shall be the prince's duty to furnish the burnt offerings, grain offerings, and drink offerings at the feasts, the new moons, and the Sabbaths, all the appointed feasts of the house of Israel. He shall provide the sin offerings, grain offerings, burnt offerings, and peace offerings to make atonement on behalf of the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord God, In the first month, on the first day of the month, you shall take a bull from the herd without blemish and purify the sanctuary. The priest shall take some of the blood of the sin offering and put it on the doorposts of the temple, the four corners of the ledge of the altar, and the posts of the gate of the inner court. You shall do the same on the seventh day of the month for anyone who has sinned through error or ignorance, so you shall make atonement for the people. In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month, you shall celebrate the feast of the Passover, and for seven days unleavened bread shall be eaten. On that day the prince shall provide for himself and all the people of the land a young bull for a sin offering. And on the seven days of the festival he shall provide as a burnt offering to the Lord seven young bulls and seven rams without blemish on each of the seven days, and a male goat daily for a sin offering. And he shall provide as a grain offering an ephah for each bull, an ephah for each ram, and a hen of oil to each ephah. In the seventh month, on the fifteenth day of the month, and for the seven days of the feast, he shall make the same provision for sin offerings, burnt offerings, and grain offerings, and for the oil. Do you like this show, and maybe you've thought about making one of your own? Well, let me tell you about Anchor. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or your desktop. Now, you can even add any song from Spotify directly to your episodes. The possibilities are endless for what you can create, whether it's music analysis or your own radio show or something that we've never heard before. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you, so it can be heard on all the great places like Spotify, Apple Podcast, and many more. And you can even make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything that you need to make a podcast all in one place. And so if you're interested, download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. The modern world increasingly believes in a God who is not there. Even though the opinion polls repeatedly demonstrate that a high proportion of people, at least in the West, still quote-unquote believe in God, the nature of that God has shifted dramatically. In place of the old certainties of a transcendent God, people have come to believe in a more imminent God, a God who is not there any more than he or she is here. God is now perceived more as a universal life force than as a personality. The heart of such a creed is expressed in the familiar benediction from the Star Wars films, May the Force be with you. Now one of the consequences of that societal shift is a loss of belief in moral absolutes and the correlation of an absence of any sense of guilt over personal wrongdoing. If God is not outside me, then there's no basis for a morality outside of me. Whereas the modern generation sought empowerment to live lives that were good, according to some objective standard, the postmodern generation seeks freedom to follow whatever personal whim drives them. Although this postmodern generation might not find the music to its taste, their attitude is summed up in the lyric from The Sound of Music. Climb every mountain, ford every stream, follow every byway till you find your dream. The idea that God is absent from us because of our sin and cannot be found by us no matter how diligently we search is alien to our contemporaries. Now, in contrast to the vague pantheism of so much of modernism, 
Christians believe in the God who is there, as Francis Schaeffer so eloquently put it. A life lived without reference to this God is a life lived without its center. He is the mountain peak for which all climbers are unwittingly looking. He is the country on the other side that the forders seek. He is the goal in search of which those wandering the byways travel. He's the reality behind every dream. This, however, does not mean that all roads lead to God. Far from it. Because of sin, the most accessible and well-traveled roads lead away from God. Left to ourselves, the natural result of all our searching is futile thinking and darkened hearts. By nature, we continually suppress the truth and exchange God's glory for all kinds of idolatries. However, the truth of God's existence means that we can proclaim to the restless wanderers of the postmodern generation that there is rest and real freedom to be found only in Christ. God is neither dead, nor is he absent, nor is he silent. He is there, and he is constantly speaking to us, addressing us through the glories of creation and the powerful proclamation of his word. As creatures, we were made to serve someone, and we cannot escape that destiny. Whatever we value in this world becomes our idol and our master, even the pursuit of freedom and liberty itself. True freedom and true fulfillment come ironically only as we submit ourselves to the one we were made to serve. And if God is objectively there, and if his word is objectively true, and if life may only be found through his presence in our heart, then the question of how we may approach such a God becomes pressing. Here, the need of the postmodern person is the same as that of the modern, the notorious sinner the same as the righteous living Pharisee. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned, and the least sin is sufficient to drive away the life-giving presence of the only true God. How then can we stand in his presence? The only way is to come to the altar. If God is to dwell in our hearts, then those hearts must first be cleansed by him. We need the blood of purification applied to our hearts and our lives by Christ Jesus, who wipes away our sin. It is that blood that cleanses us of all unrighteousness and makes our hearts fit places for God to indwell. It is that blood that is at work in our lives, erecting a wall between us and sin so that sin cannot have dominion over us. To be sure, that wall is not yet complete in this life. Sin remains ever with us, our constant unwelcome companion. But the assurance of this new temple is that if Christ has entered our hearts and begun the good work of purification, he will not stop until the wall between us and sin is higher and more effective than that which Ezekiel saw in his vision of the temple. But when Christ comes into our lives, he does so in only one role, as king. One of the problems that existed in Judah was a confusion over who was really sovereign, a confusion that demonstrated itself in the proliferation of memorial stele, glorifying earthly kings in a building intended to glorify the heavenly king. That may seem like a distant problem to us until we start to examine our own hearts and ask how much of our lives are lived to our own glory and how much is lived to God's glory. Who is really sovereign in your decision-making? Who calls the shots in how you spend your money and how you spend your time? Who is Lord in how you arrange your priorities? Who occupies the center of your thoughts? All of a sudden, those questions strike a little closer to home. Although we may confess with our mouths that our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, all too often our lives tell a very different story. Now we can also ask the same question of our churches. Who is really being glorified in what goes on in our worship services? How many of our songs and hymns focus on ourselves, on how good knowing God makes us feel? How many, on the other hand, exalt Him for who He is and what He has done for us in Christ? How often do we emerge from a service 
more impressed by the skills of the preacher or the musicians or the soloist than we are overwhelmed by the grace and glory of God. How much of our church's activities are focused on bringing glory to God compared to how much time, effort, and money are focused on meeting our various needs? I suspect that we too have our memorial stele that need to be swept away. If we wish to experience the Spirit of God powerfully at work in our midst, we too have domesticated the church of God, turning it from His kingdom into a little extension of our own kingdoms. But God will live in our midst only as the King and nothing less. Now, what's in it for me may seem like a crass approach to discerning religious truth. Such an approach feels too much like health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. They promise an immediate cash payoff for actions of devotions to God. And in reaction, Christians have sometimes wanted to discuss the questions of faith more objectively, as if we should be able to delight in a religion that is true, even though its truth is of no benefit to us personally. Well, an extreme position in this direction was developed by Samuel Hopkins back in the late 18th century in New England. He held that a Christian should be willing to be damned for the glory of God. The true believer should, so the argument went, desire to serve God even in the absence of any reward. However, Scripture is more balanced than either the health and wealth extreme or the Samuel Hopkins extreme. Jesus himself asks us to consider carefully the payoff involved in different allegiances when he says, What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? He urges us to expend ourselves to store up treasure in heaven. Paul stresses repeatedly that our sonship makes us heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus. Now, it is this future reward that makes our present suffering of such little account. The world may consider that promise of little account, disdainfully describing it as a pie in the sky when you die. But for Paul, it is the basis for a hope that brings patience in the midst of a terrible present. The hope is not mercenary. It is simply the natural desire of love to possess its object. The person who disdains pie in the sky is probably a person with no love of pie. The function of the scriptural teaching of rewards is twofold. First, it stresses the accountability of the saints to God, as well as their future vindication by him. And on the one hand, God expects fruitfulness from his servants, and will hold everyone accountable for the use of the resources and opportunities that have been entrusted to each one. Much is expected of the one to whom much is given. On the other hand, it is God to whom we are accountable and to whom we are to look for our reward. The other aspect of the Bible's teaching is particularly important for those in exile, like Ezekiel's readers, and for us, who struggle to live in a world where it seems that the immoral thrive while the godly struggle to make ends meet. It speaks to those who, like the psalmist, are tempted to envy the arrogant on account of the prosperity of the wicked. It speaks to all of us, who have bought into the ancient lie that's presently promoted very vigorously from Madison Avenue that a man's life consists in the abundance of his possessions. Well, the answer for Ezekiel and for the psalmist comes from a visit to the sanctuary, the place of God's presence with his people. There, he is shown that what really counts in life are not the toys of this world, but the joys of life in the presence of God. Ezekiel could have echoed the psalmist's words in Psalm 73, Whom have I in heaven but you, and all earth, and earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. In biblical terms, the reward that Christians look for and will receive is not a material one. We don't long for bigger and better mansions in heaven, still less for Cadillacs and country club homes here on earth. Our heart's desire is to approach the presence of Almighty God and to stand before Him, 
to be able to cast down our crowns at his feet and worship, lost in wonder, lost in awe and praise. For us, as for the psalmist, it is simply good to be near God. That is the pie in the sky for which we long so passionately, and we could never be content to be eternally without it. There is only one way to enter this reward of eternal life in the close presence of God, and that's the way of the cross. When James and John sought the privilege of sitting at Jesus' right and left hand in glory, the problem was not that they saw it, but the way in which they sought it. To be close to Jesus is indeed the ultimate reward that heaven offers, but it is not to be had for the asking. Rather, it belongs to those who have drunk the cup of Jesus and shared in his baptism. Now, such privilege is opened up to all Christians through his death in our place. When we are baptized, we are baptized into his death and the fruit that flows from his drinking of the cup in our place. Yet, the scriptures also teach of a special reward reserved for those who have followed closely after the way of the suffering servant in this life. We are heirs of his glory in the world to come insofar as we share in his sufferings in the present. However, the privilege of close access to God is a reward that we don't have to wait for eternity to begin to experience. We get to sample the first fruits of the pie ahead of time. Even now, we can approach the throne of God with boldness, presenting our praises and our petitions, basking in the glory of his love. But if we expect to experience the full blessing of communion with God, our behavior must reflect his holiness. For the Zadokites, access to God's presence meant heavy restrictions on their lifestyle. There were things they could not touch, places they could not go, food they could not eat, and clothes they could not wear if they were to minister in the presence of the all-holy God. So too for us, if we expect to experience the blessing of God's presence with us, then our lifestyle will be, from the world's perspective, restricted. People around us will undoubtedly think us strange, narrow people, because we don't do the things they delight to do. They will find us odd in our commitment to the truth over convenient lies, to God's word over more fashionable contemporary perspectives, to morality in an age in which anything goes. But we are not accountable to them and their scale of values. Our scale of values should be centered around the glory of communion with God in the present and eternal life in his presence in the days to come, both of which should motivate us to lives of purity. Our world is turned right side up, as John Newton put it. What words can express the privilege and honor of believers who, whenever they please, have audience of the King of Kings, whose compassion, mercy, and power are, like His Majesty, infinite. The world wonders at their indifference to the vain pursuits and amusements in which others are engrossed, that they are so patient in trouble, so inflexible in their conduct, so well satisfied with that state of poverty and obscurity which, in the Lord, for the most part, allots them. But the wonder would cease if what passes in secret were publicly known. They have obtained the pearl of great price. They have communion with God. They derive their wisdom, strength, and comfort from on high, and cast all their cares on Him, who they assuredly know vouchsafes to take care of them. And cast all their cares on Him, who they assuredly know vouchsafes to take care of them. They have obtained the pearl of great price. They have communion with God. Thank you for joining me today. I hope this has been encouraging to you. If so, please let me know by visiting the links that you find under the Connect With Us section in the show notes. I'm a simple man and I could use the encouragement. If you've been blessed enough that you would like to support the podcast, I would greatly appreciate that as well. You can go to buymeacoffee.com slash DBR podcast to make either a one-time gift or to sign up for a monthly recurring membership gift. Until tomorrow, keep reading, 
and keep worshiping.